So what was the Buddha's view on free will? That's a question we'll try to answer coming right up. So I'm Doug Smith. I'm study director at the Secular Buddhist Association. That's secularbuddhism.org. If you're new to the channel and interested in, in trying to help promote a, a wiser and a kinder and a less stress-filled world, consider subscribing. So this will be a kind of a question and answer video. Uh, recently, uh, Patrick Cahill asked a question about uh, the Buddha's view on free will because he was interested in how control works in, in early Buddhism. That is the issue of what kind of control we have over ourselves and the world. But before I get into that, I should say that free will as a concept really comes, uh, I think, more from the West. We really don't find a concept of free will per se in, in early Buddhism, really in much of Buddhism at all. So uh, I think it's, it's helpful to get into actually what we mean by free will by looking at a little bit of a history uh, within the West. And probably the earliest we can go back to is Democritus, uh, an early uh, Greek philosopher who lived approximately 5th, 4th century BCE, a little bit after the Buddha's uh, lifetime or during and after the Buddha's lifetime. And Democritus uh, was an atomist. He was probably the first atomist, which is to say he believed that the world was made up of atoms in the void. Atoms sort of uh, going around, bouncing in, into each other like, uh, like billiard balls uh, in a void. And in this kind of view, of course, the motion of all these atoms is determined by laws of nature. And so therefore, there's a sense in which all is determined. So if you knew the state and motion of all the atoms at one time, you could at least potentially, uh, theoretically, predict the entire uh, past and future of the universe. And this concerned a lot of people. In particular, uh, Epicurus, who was the founder of the Epicurean school uh, of ancient uh, Greek and then Roman philosophy, ended up saying that there had to be some kind of, or there was some kind of uh, what he called a swerve that happened that allowed us to have responsibility and free will among these atoms in the void. Now, Epicurus lived from the 4th to the 3rd century BCE, a little bit after Democritus. And it's not entirely clear what he meant by this swerve, but at least to me it seems like he must have been talking about some kind of motion in these atoms in this void that was unpredictable from the initial state or the prior state of the universe. So a sort of supernatural kind of occurrence, which again, it's not entirely clear, but it seems to me must have been associated with making decisions of certain kinds, uh, volitional actions of certain kinds. So you might say that the atoms in the, in the brain and the body were going in one direction, and then when one made a decision, those atoms sort of swerved out of, what, out of uh, the kind of trajectory would have, we would have expected them to take. On the other hand, uh, the Stoic philosopher Chrysippus, who lived in the 3rd century BCE, he tended to view that uh, determinism had nothing, had, was not incompatible with people having uh, will, with, with people making uh, volitional actions, with people having free will. That is, for Chrysippus, uh, our volitional actions, our freely willed actions, are part of the causal uh, nature of the universe. They're caused and they have causes. And I think between Epicurus and Chrysippus, we see the two, at least the origins of the two major schools uh, involving free will in the West. That is, uh, for Epicurus, we have what eventually became what we might call libertarian, or what you usually call libertarian free will. And in Chrysippus, we have what is later called a compatibilist free will. And the, uh, the idea of libertarian free will is eventually fully developed in uh, Catholic theology, where, this, where there's a notion that uh, our freely willed action stems from our eternal soul, which is something that exists outside of the causal, ne uh, causal nexus of, of physical reality. So it's something that's outside of cause and effect. It's uncaused. Uh, the freely willed action is an uncaused cause. That is, it's something that, that does not itself have a cause, but is able to cause us to do physical action. That is, this kind of free volition is something that has ultimate control over the mind, and at least in a, in a well-functioning body, has ultimate control over the body as well. And this kind of view of, free, of freely willed action being libertarian in the sense of, of coming out of, of an eternal soul, of being uncaused by the world, and of having an ultimate control over at least certain aspects of the mind, if not the body, this, this is almost identical to the Brahminic or Upanishadic notion of free will that we find in India, to which the Buddha was responding. Now the 
opposite notion of free will, which is the compatibilist notion that we saw in Chrysippus, the Stoic, is one that was supported by uh, the philosopher Thomas Hobbes, who lived in the 17th century, as well as the contemporary philosopher Dan Dennett, who is perhaps the most famous at discussing this kind of compatibilist free will. And I'll try to look for a, a good talk by him on, on on YouTube, because I know he has a number of them that I, th I believe are, are recorded. If I can find one, I'll put it up here on the screen. Because the argument for this kind of free will is one that surprises a lot of people who don't have a phys philosophical background. I would say that compatibilism in general is probably the most uh, popular view within uh, contemporary professional philosophers in the West. Uh, but it's one that takes some understanding to, to, to see how it works. Basically, the view in a nutshell is that freely willed actions are the kinds of things that have to come out of causes and effects. To, to, to freely will an act is to do it with, with a, our own desires and beliefs. In other words, uh, if I'm freely going to get a glass of water, it's because uh, I want the water, I have a desire for water, and I believe that the water exists over there, that there's water in the, in the faucet. These uh, beliefs and desires come out of a nexus of causes and effects. And without that nexus, we wouldn't have free will. So the compatibilist view is really that free will requires a kind of uh, causal determinism, at least in some respects. Now I should say that there's a third uh, option besides a libertarian free will and compatibilist free will, which is an example of no free will, or of, we might say, fatalism. That, that there's no such thing as free will, that, that all of our actions are determined, and so therefore there's really nothing that we can do to change the future. And so therefore that we are fated to uh, to undergo the future that we're fated to undergo. There's nothing we can do to change that. And I think some uh, a Protestant theology tends to go in this direction with the view that, that God is the only being with so-called so free will in the true sense, and that all of us are simply uh, undergoing the fates that God uh, determined for us in advance. So that, in a very, very small nutshell, is, is sort of views of, of free will in the West. Now, when we import that into to Buddhism and ask, you know, what, what would the Buddha have said about this? we're going to have to make some interpretive moves. So, uh, because the Buddha never really discussed free will per se, I mean, he never talked about it as an issue. Uh, in the more detailed arguments that we have in the West, the West, the, the Buddha probably would have thought that those were not particularly useful. Nevertheless, I think it's important to note that the Buddha had some things to say that, that really do bear on this question. And I think we should start by looking at what the Buddha rejects, the kinds of views that the Buddha rejects. And the first of those is that the Buddha rejects the notion of a permanent soul. He rejects the notion of an everlasting soul, of a soul that, that continues from moment to moment. He rejects the notion of a soul that's outside of the causal nexus of, of causes and effects. He rejects the notion of ultimate control. In fact, in one of his most famous suttas, the, I, I believe it's the second sutta, the, the second uh, uh, discourse that he gave uh, to his first followers, was a discourse on non-self. And one of the points that he made was that, that if we had per, uh, perfect control over any aspect of our, our, our body or our mind, we would be able to change it at will as we liked. But we can't. Certainly we cannot change our body at will. We can't stop ourselves from aging. We can't stop ourselves uh, from getting sick. And when it comes to the mind, which is the paradigmatic example of, of our having perfect control, at least on the Western notion of libertarian free will, uh, I think even five or ten minutes of meditation will tell us that we do not have perfect control over really any aspect of our mind. And of course the idea of, of, of weakness of the will in the West, or the idea that we really can't force ourselves to will things that we, don't, that we might want to will, shows that we don't even have perfect control over our will. So these kinds of arguments in early Buddhism, I think, uh, demonstrate pretty clearly that the Buddha rejected a libertarian free will. Now, there are no aspects of libertarian free will that I think the Buddha would have really liked. I mean, this is because libertarian free will comes out of a theology, if you like, which in uh, India is very similar to the theology it came uh, in, out of in the West. A theology of permanent souls, a theology of a kind of an ultimate reality that was outside of the nexus of causes and effects, but that nevertheless had an effect upon uh, this nexus that, that could change it in certain ways. And this notion that if we could only come to know our permanent soul in some intimate sense, we would understand uh, the nexus of really our perfect control, or in the West, 
the way that we are uh, the same as God in some sense. But that's not the only view that the, that the Buddha rejected. He also rejected the fatalism of Makali Gosala, who was one of his uh, cultural competitors at the time, another philosopher who, who taught his own views in, in ancient India. And Makali Gosala's view was that, that we have no power or control at all. It was a kind of fatalism. That is, that since we have no power or control, uh, over anything, the, the universe is set up the way it is, it will go the way it wants to go. Uh, there's nothing we can do about anything. And so therefore there's no uh, practice that we can do to free ourselves, there's no way we can make ourselves any better, uh, and we will reach, uh, let's say, the end of our path when the universe decides that it's time for us to reach the end of our path, and there's nothing we can do about that. And the Buddha was, was very opposed to this kind of view because, uh, as he saw it, this led to a philosophy of non-doing, of, of basically futility, of, of not wishing to, to do anything to make yourself any better. And as a result, he saw it as really a pernicious kind of view. The Buddha was also opposed to uh, indeterminism, uh, views that, that the universe or ourselves or our, ple our pleasures and pains arose indeterministically, just uh, randomly, that is, uh, without any lawful basis. Because this as well, this view as well, leads to a kind of uh, feeling of futility. If we can't uh, discover the causal source of our arising and then the rising of our uh, pleasures and pains, of our problems and our successes, if we can't uh, attempt to determine and, and actually determine the, the, the causal origins of those things, then there's nothing we can do about them. There's nothing that we can do to counteract them because they arise simply by chance and they go away, let's, we would expect, simply by chance on this kind of view. I should perhaps make one small aside here when it comes to indeterminism, because some uh, contemporary people, uh, when arguing about free will, uh, seem to think that uh, indeterminism of some kind, usually they talk about quantum indeterminism, uh, may help us understand free will. Uh, the idea being, I suppose, that the free will, these kind of, uh, we might say, swerves in Epicurus's sense, may come from quantum indeterminacy, and that's what gives us our freedom. But I think if we really uh, consider this uh, seriously, we'll see that that's uh, no solution at all. Uh, when, we, when we find indeterminism, what we find is, is random twitches and jerks if it comes to the body. What we find is somebody with a kind of palsy. We don't find, uh, when it comes to random uh, action, uh, true freedom. In other words, the view that, that indeterminacy uh, gives us freedom essentially uh, runs together two issues. One is the issue of our not being caused by our, pr our, our prior states, but the other being that we should be caused by our prior states because if we're acting freely, we're doing things on the basis of reasons, we're doing things on the basis of our past experiences, we're doing things on the basis of our past desires, and all of those things are determined. So if we really were acting indeterminately, what we would be doing is jerking around at random and not acting in a deliberate and uh, insightful way. So, but the Buddha was, uh, was definitely opposed to these notions of indeterminism. He was also opposed to the notion that, that either our past karma or that some uh, all-powerful god was responsible for everything that happens right now. Again, because that led to a, a philosophy of non-doing. If everything now is determined by our own past karma, then we can't escape it. And if everything that we do right now is caused uh, by some all-powerful god, then again, we can't escape it. So therefore, it leads to a kind of a notion of futility, of non-doing, of a decision that, that there's nothing we need to do to practice to become better because everything is already set up for us. In other words, when we look at the kinds of views that the Buddha rejected, we can say that the Buddha rejected uh, libertarian free will, the notion that free will comes as an uncaused cause out of our own soul. He also rejected fatalism, that is to say that there's nothing we can do that we don't have free will. So now that we've seen what the Buddha didn't like, now let's, let's turn a bit to the uh, views that the Buddha actually uh, accepted and taught. And the first of those, I would say, in a general umbrella sense, is that the Buddha taught that there was a way towards freedom, that there's a way that we can free ourselves. In particular, we can free ourselves by seeing the causal chain for what it is by understanding dependent origination, which is, uh, in a nutshell, what he thought the causal chain was. That is to say, there's freedom from a kind of bondage. Now, how do we understand bondage for the Buddha? Bondage for the Buddha was uh, bondage to what we might call malign psychological states. That is, states of greed 
hatred, and ignorance. States which will do ourselves ill and do other people ill. That is bondage for the Buddha. So what is the point of having a view of free will? Why do we even consider free will as, as a concept within Western philosophy? And I think a lot of it has to, in fact, I would say the, the main point of a concept of free will has to do with ethics. It has to do with our understanding when we are responsible for our actions and when we are not responsible for our actions. So, for example, we understand that if somebody, as we say, of their own free will, uh, of sound mind and body, uh, picks up a, a weapon and goes into a store and robs the store, we want to say that person did it of their own free will. They're responsible for it. Those two things really mean the same thing. On the other hand, someone who is forced to do it, let's say, by somebody strapping a bomb to them and saying, I'll, you know, I'll blow you up if you don't go and rob this store, we want to say that person didn't do this of their own free will. They were compelled to. Or if they're under the effects of some drug, if they've taken a drug and are out of their minds, we want to say, or if they are mentally unstable in some, in some sense, that, that we want to say they're not fully responsible, or maybe they're not responsible at all. And this, this kind of notion of responsibility and free will uh, we find reflected in our own legal system. To say that fatalism is true of the kind of Makali Gosala is to say basically that no one is ever responsible for anything. And this is in fact one of the many reasons why the Buddha rejected the views of Makali Gosala and other uh, similar fatalists of his time, or uh, there, was al there were also um, materialists of the time who had a similar kind of view. That, that no one was ever responsible for their actions, that they could do whatever they wanted to. For the Buddha, I think, if we're, if we're reading back the notion of free will into the ancient texts and, and po the Pali texts, we might want to say that for the Buddha there are two kinds of freedom. Um, the first kind I would call mundane freedom, and this is the freedom I just discussed. This is the freedom that we are talking about when we're talking about moral responsibility, when we're talking about karma for the Buddha. And the Buddha definitely believed that we were morally responsible for our actions. That if we did something wrong, we were morally responsible for that. And if we did something right, again, we were morally responsible. And in either respect, he believed, we would be paid back for it in some sense. And this is something that's true of us simply in virtue of being a sentient being. Uh, we don't have to be special to have this kind of, moral, of, of, of freedom of the will. Even animals have it. Any sentient being for the Buddha has this kind of uh, moral responsibility. They have free will in this sense. However, the Buddha, I think, also would have been in favor of a second notion of free will. And this is the notion that I was discussing when I said that the Buddha believed that we could free ourselves from bondage. Of course, um, all of humanity, basically, uh, all, of, uh, all of the sentient beings for the Buddha, with a very, very few exceptions, are, although they're acting freely in the first sense, in the mundane sense, they're not acting freely in the supramundane sense, we might say. Uh, they're not truly free. They're only free in the mundane sense. They're only free in the sense of having moral responsibility. So for the Buddha, then, the supramundane sense of freedom is basically being freed from the ten fetters, the fetters that bind us to samsara. These are the fetters of greed, hatred, and delusion. They're the fetters of, of clinging to the self. They're the fetters of conceit, and so on. There's many, there's ten of them. Uh, there are different num there's different numbering systems, but in one of the more famous, there's ten fetters in total. And the exact uh, character of each of them doesn't really matter, but the point is that the Buddha did believe in a, in a supramundane sense of, of, of freedom, which was, we might say, a, a kind of perfect human functioning. In the mundane sense, uh, all humans are free. All sentient beings are free. But in the supramundane sense, only the ones who are really functioning at the top level, who do not have these malign psychological influences, are completely free. So that, in a nutshell, I think, is the Buddha's view of free will. Uh, is it a strictly uh, compatibilist? I think it is compatible, it's a compatibilist view of free will, that is, that free will is compatible with a kind of deterministic picture. Now, to what extent did the Buddha really believe in the deterministic picture, let's say, that we find in Democritus? It's not entirely clear. He never really discusses that. And I think if pressed on it, he might say that the, the issue of determinism was one that was not edifying, that it really didn't lead to, uh, to freedom, and so he would just leave that aside. Nevertheless, the general picture of dependent origination is a picture which is, I think, completely compatible, if we want to say that, with determinism. Of course, it's not compatible in the sense that 
there is a, a gap that we're able to change. If, we, if we're able to become free, we're able to get ourselves out of this chain of dependent origination. But we can also say that the reason we're able to break that chain is because of other causes and conditions in our lives that allow us to see the chain for what it is. And by seeing the chain for what it is, uh, we're able to unbind ourselves from it. And that itself is a kind of causal picture as well. So while I do think that compatibilism is probably the best Western picture for early Buddhism, it's not entirely clear, and the Buddha left the issue somewhat uh, indeterminate, somewhat, somewhat fuzzy around the edges, because I don't think he was interested in the topic at all. I mean, he never discusses the topic per se. This is a philosophic, this is definitely a philosophical issue rather than one that's, that touches our lives. But I think it's a philosophical issue, at least in my experience, that tends to interest a lot of people. Uh, they tend to want to know about, you know, what free will says and whether we have free will or not. And so knowing at least what the Buddha's view might have been about it can, ex can I think, illuminate that a little bit. And I think certainly if we can get ourselves away from uh, views of fatalism, if we can get ourselves away from views of this kind of um, liber libertarian free will that involves a permanent soul and complete control, that we are to an extent uh, getting ourselves more in the line of, of a, a wise, I think, view of the world, and one that's uh, somewhat less stressed uh, in the sense that we aren't stressed over uh, our lives being somehow futile. But I know that free will discussions always uh, tend to raise, uh, raise all kinds of questions and, and people aren't clear about what, what uh, compatibilism really means or what libertarian uh, free will really means. So uh, if you have any comments or questions, please do feel free to leave them down below. And either I'll get to them or maybe somebody else will try to get to them, uh, answer, answer questions, get into a discussion. That would be really great. And thanks so much uh, for all of your uh, kind questions and comments on prior videos. I always love reading them. And uh, we will catch you on the next video. So thanks so much. Bye-bye.